coming. Iyasegi. There is something special about a mother bathing her child. So I have decided to bathe my daughter. I want to wipe away that woman's handprints and reclaim my daughter. This Segi was not the daughter who left that night. We had been waiting impatiently for her return. The children's foreheads were pressed against the glass sliding door. I could not sit, so I perched on the edge of my armchair. When the pickup drove into the compound, the windscreen bought a piece of the sun with it. The children jumped up and down as if their feet were made of rubber. Baba Segi had hardly opened the door of the pickup when they covered Segi with their hands. They all wanted to touch my Segi, as if to confirm that it was really her. Segi looked at them all and touched their foreheads the way she liked to do. She smiled, but her lips were cracked and full of pus. Her father carried her into the sitting room and eased her into his armchair. Iyatope rushed to her side and propped her up with cushions, but as soon as her back touched them, her head dropped onto the armrest. She looked like a ghost. Her face had lost its fullness and her forehead was full of scales. Her eyeballs were yellow, as if they had been bathed in urine. Even her breasts were flattened against her chest. What used to be firm, supple skin sagged like beaten leather. All her hair was gone. Her scalp shone like marble. I went to my daughter and knelt down before her. I put one hand to her bosom and caressed her head with the other. It was as if Segi was deafened by the sensation, but she did not ask me to stop. She just looked at me and said, Mama, I am here. I am alive. Yes, my child, I told her. You left me, but you have returned. I stood and turned to all the faces around us. My daughter has returned. My voice was no louder than a whisper, but it reached every ear. Even Taju wept tears of joy on the veranda. I would not have left her side, but Babasegi asked for his food. My belly is ringing its bell, he said. Bring food for me and my daughter. This is a day of joy. The doctors said it was the speed with which we rushed her to the hospital that saved her life. She was at death's door, but the gods took mercy on me and sent her back. A million slaves and a thousand servants cannot equal the value of a child. When a man dies, only his children can truly mourn him. The gods have saved me from burying my daughter, and I am grateful. Let everybody in the house drink a bottle of Coca-Cola. The children skipped around the room with glee. Seeing my husband in such high spirits gave me great hope. His affection for Segi was clear and unwavering. When I returned with his food, I found Bolanle in the sitting room. She was at my daughter's side. She touched Segi's cheek with the tip of her finger. To my surprise, Segi clutched Bolanle's hand and drew it to her breasts. They traded words I could not hear. That was when Segi spoke the words that burnt my heart. My father, she said, it would please me greatly if you allow me to recuperate in Auntie Bolanle's room. A whirlwind may as well have blown into the room and rained hailstones on all who were present. Every eye turned to me. What could I do when I knew it was my daughter's sickness that was speaking? Whatever Bolanle had done to bewitch her was still working, but it was not the time to fight. Bolanle shook her head and covered her face with her hand. It was the rumbling of Babasegi's belly that broke the silence. He looked fondly into his daughter's eyes. As you wish, my daughter, he said as you wish. He also knew it was not the time to ask questions, but he did not just leave the matter like that. He called me to his side and told me to bring my ear. When I knelt by him, he said, your child will always be your child and you will always be her mother. The first thing I did before preparing the bath water was to make sure Bolanle had left the house. I did not want anyone to come between me and my daughter. I was a woman and I knew where to sponge and where not to apply any pressure at all. I also knew that there would be no scrubbing. Segi was molting like a viper, and the new skin was tender and raw. I took off all her clothes and helped her onto the stool that I had placed in the bath. She sat there like a hunchback, and I poured bowlfuls of tepid water down her back. Daughter, why don't you speak to me? I asked. Segi raised her head to look at me. Her eyes were accusing, but she said nothing. I could tell that her stomach was full of words. Is it your hair? Is that why you are so silent? It will grow back, you'll see. Segi shook her head from right to left and rested her chin on her bosom. Then it must be your breasts. The fullness will return. Segi looked at her breasts and lifted them one at a time as if she were weighing them. Then why won't you talk to me? There is no shame in illness. Is there shame in death? She did not even have the strength to clear her throat. Daughter, why would you say such a thing? I was perplexed. You will not die. I will not mourn my own child. But other mothers can mourn their daughters. That would please you, wouldn't it? What goes on in other homes is no concern of mine, Segi. You are my concern. No, Mama. What I asked was if it would please you if another mother had to mourn her daughter. She coughed and grabbed the pail for support. Blood trickled from one of her nostrils. I reached out to rinse away the blood, but Segi pushed my hand aside. Mama, the doctor said I was poisoned. They said I could have died. Why would there be poison in our house? It was the food I ate the night I went to Auntie Bolanle's room, wasn't it? 
I dropped the small washbowl into the pail and reached for a towel. Segi, do not delve into matters that do not concern you, I said firmly. Segi stood up and stretched out her arms, exhibiting what remained of her. Mama, look at me and tell me again that this matter does not concern me. I looked away and swallowed the lump in my throat. Segi looked like she had been in the ground for weeks. Her skin clung to her bones. You are provoking me, Segi. Then let the daughter who provokes you die, she said. If someone in this house is serving poisonous food and my own mother will not find out who it is, how is my life worth living? Let me cover you, child. The wind has teeth today. I tried to spread the towel around Segi's shoulders, but she flung it into the bucket with all the strength in her wasted arms. No! Let me die! She screamed. By the time she closed her mouth, she was breathless and spent. The food was not meant for you, child. It wasn't meant for you. It was as if I had gone mad. She watched me as I tore my dress from the neck to the hem. I slapped the walls and scratched my face. I boxed my breasts and pulled my hair. I could not control myself. Segi knelt in the bathtub, slowly shaking her head. Then, as quietly as she started, she said, Mama, I am cold. Please bring me a dry towel. Washing day, Iya Tope. Iya Segi decided to bathe her daughter today. It is good because since the girl went to hospital, both Iya Segi and Iya Femi have been behaving as if they don't remember how to be mothers. Akin came to my room and told me that their school uniforms were dirty. I told him to take the washing bowls outside. I gave them soap and sat with them. There was sadness in the home and it was good for them to do something that they normally enjoyed. Like all children, they like to play with water. They formed a ring around the giant heap of laundry and squatted before the white basins. But they did not talk like they used to. Segi was not there to flick soap suds at them. She was not there to start the songs they all knew and loved to sing. Femi was still angry because his mother wouldn't give him money for sweets, so he sank his hands in the basin and refused to scrub. Like his mother, he only thinks about himself. He just sat there with snot running from his nose. Every so often, he stretched out the tip of his tongue and licked the mucus into his mouth. Any other time, the other children would have ignored him, but Aki stood up from his basin and slapped him across the face. The older boy left a streak of soap suds across Femi's cheek. When he recovered from the shock, he began rubbing his clothes together. It is a wonder that a good boy like Ake could have come out of Iyasegi's belly. I have been watching him since he was young. One day he will grow up to be a good father. He does not spoil the children like Segi does. He cares for them, but he is firm. He knows what is wrong and what is just. I remember one day when they were all sitting at the dining table to do their homework. That day, Bolanle passed and asked if they needed any help, but Segi's voice was unyielding. No, she said. That is my job, she said. When it is Bolanle, she knows how to raise her shoulders, but she lets the children ride her like a donkey. Who would have thought that one day Bolanle would suckle her? Hm. This world is full of mysteries. So on that day by the dining table, Femi started his usual stubbornness. First, he sat and looked at his pencil, as if he did not know what to do with it. Then he started to cry, like an eight-day-old baby. He said he didn't understand anything, not even his name. He shifted his seat close to Segi and begged her to do his homework for him. Why wouldn't he expect people to do everything for him when his mother gives before he asks? Iyafemi has ruined him. He is so rotten that maggots fall from his body. If Aki had not been there that day, Segi would have abandoned her own work to write for him. She would have held his hand and written the answers. Aki did not allow it. He looked hard at his sister. That boy does not deserve the caressing you give him, he said. Segi laughed and told him that not everyone was lucky enough to be born with great cleverness. Aki did not stop. He hardened his face at Femi. How is it that you manage to remember every character on every TV program and the name of every football player, yet your brain falls asleep when you are asked to write one, two, three? He asked. What wisdom from a young head, I thought. Segi warned Aki to keep his voice down so that Iyafemi didn't come through the door to give him a tongue lashing. If she comes, I will tell her how lazy her son is, he said. His voice did not shake. He was not afraid. I marveled at his courage because even I, a wife, could not consider saying such words to Iyafemi. That Aki will grow up to be a good man. Before the sun came down, Iyasegi called a meeting. Without looking up, she told Iyafemi and me about the bathroom talk with Segi. If I said I understood what she was saying, I would be lying. Where would Segi get the boldness to speak to her mother that way? But the more Iyasegi spoke, the clearer the work of their hands became. So they did it. They stole Segi's spirit. If only I were braver. If I knew how to stop my tears, I wouldn't have cried so many. I listened to Iyasegi's words, but I could not say anything. Words would not form in my tongue. I could only pray that the gods would open the eyes of mercy on our home. All the time Iyasegi was speaking, I could see that Iyafemi's palms were itching. When she couldn't keep the question down anymore, she turned to Iyasegi. Tell me, she said, how do we know that she will not tell her father what you said?
Since she's been back from hospital, she refuses to eat unless her father is seated before her. And who knows what she may tell Bolanle? Or have you forgotten that they sleep together? I only ask this because we might as well start packing our belongings now. We deserve to be thrown onto the streets, I said. There isn't one thing that flies to the skies that will not eventually drop with rain. Our time here is finished. Speak for yourself, Iyatope. I could not believe that Iyafemi's mouth could still be so sharp after all the evil she had done. If you want to sweep the streets with your children, start packing, she said. Is it not Iyasegi who has divulged our secrets to her daughter? Since it was she who killed us, she will have to bury us. And besides, how do you know that it is not prison that you will go to? Segi is the apple of Babasegi's eye. No, Iyafemi. You will go to prison, I said. I do not know where I got the boldness, but I spoke my mind for once. Was I there when you were cooking your enemy's last meal? Don't you dare drag me into your murderous plot. If you had God in you, you'd be praying for the child who barely clings to life. But no, you sit here wondering how to remain in the house that you have used your hands to burn. How many times have you visited Segi to ask her where she aches? How many times have you inquired how she hears now that her right ear is deaf? Never. You prefer to hide than to do a good deed that may wipe away your sins. Continue hiding, I told her. You are not worthy of that child you have soiled. I left the women there in the sitting room. My words were for Iyasegi's ears as well. Victor, Bolanle. The wives sigh and stare into emptiness. They act as if a fist of stone has been stuffed into their throats. They don't swallow, they just sit and stare. They don't even seem to be bothered with me anymore, which is in itself confusing. I liked it better when they were predictable. Now I can't tell who has left food outside my door. It used to be so easy. Iyafemi always left the burnt scum from the bottom of the pot and topped it with a small piece of meat that had been chewed off at the corners, while Iyatope left a mound of dazzling white rice with an extra cube of beef hidden underneath. Now there were just two identical plates of food, one for me and one for Segi. I suppose it's Segi's illness. She has not put on any weight and blood trickles from her nose relentlessly. I would never say so, but her breath is foul, even when it is exhaled from her nostrils. It's a stubborn, unpleasant smell. It hangs in my room at night and I can hardly breathe. It bitters the back of the throat and clings to the bedding as if the corpse of a small beast is buried there. It's as if Segi is rotting from the inside out. She has hidden a small mirror under her pillow and she weeps every time she looks at it. A few days ago, she asked me to swear on my life that I wouldn't tell Baba Segi about it. Perhaps a few weeks ago, I would have obliged her. But now, I can't bring myself to swear on my life. Not for her. Not now. Not for anyone. I just said, I swear. And that was all there was to it. When she's asleep, I can't help but look at her. I feel like I know what troubles her. The illness has ravaged her and left her bare. She has lost control of her body, yet she wouldn't know what to do if she regained it. She knows the illness will do with her as it pleases, cease only when it decides to. It's strange, but Segi makes me feel strong. When I'm in her presence, I feel a sturdiness within me. Her fear makes me feel like there is nothing more for me to be afraid of. She said an odd thing yesterday. She said, Auntie, you are a victor. I thought she was hallucinating. Victor, I asked, but she had drifted into one of her three-minute naps. She wakes from them, a little agitated, asking questions like, Where are my wings? I left the victor matter alone and did not return to it. Victor. Nobody has called me a victor before. Even as a name, it's forceful, packed with hard, uncompromising consonants. It's impossible to say it without snarling and baring your teeth. I liked the fact that she'd said it, even if it was born of some abstract notion. She says the oddest things to her father too. Sometimes she talks, but no sounds come out of her mouth. Then when he tires and heads for the door, her voice returns. Won't you hear what I have to say, father? She asks. Babasegi returns to her side, and the wordless chatter begins again. The doctors say it is to be expected, he mutters, his voice heavy with gloom. Out. Iyasegi sat calmly in the pickup, but there was a madness crawling beneath her skin. She had heard that people on the verge of rushing naked into the streets often complained of a persistent march of ants all over their bodies. The truth was that it was Babasegi's joy that nibbled at her limbs, his smile pure and trusting, like that of a goat skipping to the slaughterhouse. The instructions had not been complicated. Take this appointment card, wake up early on Wednesday morning, dress yourself, and accompany me to the doctors. If they ask you any questions, keep nothing from them. Yasegi had sketched out her own plan. There would be no questions, only answers. She wouldn't wait for the long rope of truth to be pulled from her. She would volunteer it willingly and without persuasion, even if it made Babasegi force his head through the hospital walls. The truth, they say, cannot hide itself forever, even if it conceals itself at the bottom of a well. One day, droughts will reveal it. Bolanle's baroness had brought drought. 
Both doctors were waiting in the consultation room. Breaking the news to Babasegi was a tricky task, and Dr. Dibia wasn't entirely sure how to go about it. Did he just say it matter-of-factly? Bend his tone as if someone had died? Or was he to say it as if Babasegi should be grateful that he was born in the age of medical advancement? After all, he could have gone through his life not knowing. As Dr. Usman reached for the door handle, Dr. Dibia said he might learn something if he stayed and listened in. Dr. Usman smelt the fear behind his colleague's arrogance, so he retraced his steps to the examining table and folded his arms. He concealed a wry smile when Dr. Dibia poked his head out of the door to invite Babasegi and Iyasegi in. Doctors, this is my first wife. No man could have a better one. His face shone with pride. Very good. Mrs. Alao, thank you for coming. Please sit comfortably. Dr. Dibia was slightly embarrassed by his patient's effervescence. Things would have been so much easier if he had been in a more subdued mood. He decided to dive right in. Uh, Mrs. Alao, uh, I'm sure you are aware of the investigation we have been doing into the uh, younger Mrs. Alao's difficulties with conceiving. Mrs. Bolanle Alao, Dr. Usman offered. Iyasegi carefully undid the knot in her head tie and unraveled it to reveal a head of uneven graying hair. Then she painstakingly folded the scarf into eight equal parts and laid it carefully on the doctor's table so it jutted out no further than any of the books. With equal precision, she stood up and dropped to her knees. The doctors looked at each other. Babasegi's cheerfulness dissolved into embarrassment. My lord, she turned to her husband, words do not decide whether or not they will be uttered. But our people say the day always comes when words themselves will have their say. Her gaze returned to the doctors. Again, the doctors glanced at each other. Dr. Dibia sat back in his chair and sniffed, making his glasses slide down the bridge of his nose. I know the reason why Bolanli has not conceived, she continued. And it is not one that a thousand doctors can cure. Yam cannot cook itself. It needs a careful hand that will slice it and expose it to raging heat. Babasegi gasped in confusion. Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand you. Dr. Dibia wanted Iyasegi to spell things out for her husband. That is because you are young and do not know the ways of the world. I was a young wife when I found myself in a cloud of sadness. I was childless and restless. Every time I saw a mother rocking a baby on her back, my nipples would itch to be suckled. My husband and I tried everything. He did not let my thighs rest, but leapt between them every time dusk descended upon us. Even his mother was hungry for his seed to become fruit. Then I had an idea. It was a sinful idea, but I knew it would bring my sadness to an end. In fact, it was more than an idea. It promised to be a solution. If my husband did not have seed, then what harm could it do to seek it elsewhere? She shrugged her shoulders. So I found seed and planted it in my belly. Babasegi turned his side to his wife and looked at her through one eye only. His arm was raised in defense, as if to shield himself from the odious suggestions hidden in her parables. Are you saying that your husband is not the biological father of your first child? Dr. Dibia asked. Eureka! Not my first, not my second. Babasegi ducked as if someone had taken a swing at his face. Whoa! It cannot be. And the other wives, what about their children? Dr. Dibia asked. It might as well come out in one big gush. Better that than in dribs and drabs. I misled them. Perhaps if I had not shown the second one my way, this shame would have come out sooner. But you see, they were so desperate to be fruitful. They knew that my husband valued children above all things. So when I saw their desperation, I took pity on them and shared my secret. They also followed the same path. Babasegi whined like a dog caught wolfing down his master's dinner. So are you saying none of Mr. Alao's children are his? Not one of them. She reached out her hand to touch her husband, but he leapt from it. Dr. Usman stood up straight. Mrs. Alao, you have said quite enough, thank you. Perhaps it is better that you go home now. He could see that Babasegi was set to explode. Iyasegi rose and left the room with peace in her eyes. Babasegi's head was bowed, bent right over like a dying branch before it offers its leaves to the next gust of wind. His tears hit the floor with a quiet splat. Is there anything we can offer you, sir? A soft drink, perhaps? Dr. Dibia asked. Dr. Usman mouthed the words, let's leave him, to his colleague and tiptoed out of the room. Dr. Dibia took all the sharp instruments from his table and hurried after him. Taju. The rich have fat bellies. They swagger until the world swings to one side. They see more food and they lunge at it. They have a permanent hunger, you see. For the poor, it is different. They've never known the taste of fullness, so they stand erect. They scramble for leftovers, <laughs> not because they are hungry, but because they want to know fullness. The contentment that makes the rich think the world is theirs. I like to speak in parables. I spend a few minutes of every day pondering the unequal balance of this world. Except most of the time, my parables are too complicated, too subtle, misleading even. <laughs> I want to turn them around in my head, but my boss returns and I must turn my mind to the road. I'm not paid to be a thinker. <laughs> I'm a driver.
I shouldn't love this job like I do. Every hair on my body should reject it after what happened to my brother. The boss drove him to his death and you have set your palms on the same wheel. My mother cries. <laughs> she means it as a cautionary tale, but I tell her I drive a pickup, not a boss. You see, Faruku, the brother she speaks of, was a son worth weeping for. His skin was so yellow that he should have been born at a time when the cold Hamatan winds could not ruffle the sands. He wore his shirt open to his belly button and silver chains hung from his neck. Ha, women sought to be with him. Men thought him slick, a dandy. <laughs> he thought he was slick too. He spotted a dirty smile and his tongue would grow taut and hover between his lips when he spoke to women. Like most young men did, when they were reaching the age of wisdom, Faruku left our village to seek his fortune in Ibadan. Most of the men from Ulubon did the same. They worked or trained all week and only returned to the village at weekends to visit their families. Faruku showed he was our father's son and did something special. He trained as a driver and before long, he got a job driving public buses for a well-known transport company. I won't mention the name of this company because you are likely to know it. Everyone knows the owner. Sometimes he would drive his bus to our village and throw up the mud that had caked and set over the dust roads. He would show off the bus's gleaming burgundy and dart carelessly through shrubs and trees. He loved this reckless fun and so did we. Along with the other children, I would run after the bus, screaming with excitement, while our mothers and fathers rushed to the doorways to wave. It was hard not to want to be him, with his shirt loose, flying like a sail, a matchstick fixed to the corner of his filthy smile. <laughs> the women couldn't wait for him to return on Saturday morning. From Monday to Friday, they showered me with gifts, in the hope that I would put in a good word for them. I took their gifts, but said nothing. <laughs> Faruku would make my mouth bleed if he thought I was overreaching myself again. From the day he caught me peeping through his keyhole, he reminded me regularly that I was only nine and he was twelve years older than me. I don't hold any of his beatings against him. No, he didn't knock my head against the hard mud walls to hurt my feelings. He did it to put me in my place. Whether it worked or not was a different matter. <laughs> Peeping through his keyhole was already a habit. Faruku's keyhole held many pleasures. If anything, I learned the workings of a woman's body. Faruku could have any woman. They would chase him, yet he would make them feel that he was hot and sweaty from exertion. They wanted him and he obliged them, spotting his wry smile as they squatted over his body. I tell you, when a woman wants you, it is better to surrender and let her take you. Afterwards, you will feel like a polished coin. Women couldn't get enough of that yellow skin of his. They couldn't rest until their breasts were pressed against it, their thighs wrapped around it, their toes curled upon it. On this particular weekend, I noticed Lato Dun hadn't knocked on our front door like she'd done for the last three Saturdays. This was unusual, as loose women tended to circulate more efficiently. Faruku kept going to the door to see if she'd arrived, but by afternoon he was restless. He gave me one naira and sent me to find her. And if she doesn't follow you straight away, get on your knees and beg until she does, or see what you'll get, he snapped as he weighed his balls. I put my slippers on and wondered what was so special about her. To me, she'd be no different from the others. A child simply couldn't understand these things, you see. Latsudun gave me her hand and let me drag her and her orange peel smell into our home. Of course, she had no idea that I'd seen the droop of her breasts or her backside up. Thrice, to be exact. Latudu touched my hair, fondled my neck, and prodded my forehead before disappearing behind Faruku's door. By the time I fitted my eye into the keyhole, I was well and truly primed. Latudu lay there like a slug. When, as Faruku lifted himself from her, I glimpsed what it was that made men despise her when she went with other men. Curled between her thighs was a flawless snail. Her lips were beautifully defined halves, encasing perfect pink. So lost was I in the wonder of the pulsating snail that I forgot to look out for Faruku. He flung the door open and found me standing there with my hand twitching in my shorts. He ignored Latudun's protests and kicked me until I was doubled over. I dared not cry out. If our father heard what I'd done, he would make us both sleep in the rain. A few months later, Faruku appeared through the corn in our backyard. He was shoeless, sweating from every pore. One arm was clearly broken and there was dry blood at his fingertips. My mother called me into her room and told me to keep his arrival a secret. Her reason was simple. Faruku's bus had driven him to his death. I thought she must be mad because I knew my brother was alive, albeit distressed. I'd heard him crying in his bedroom, seen him performing ablution as if his sins had to be scraped from his skin. The truth came later. Weeks after the men in a grey Volvo barged into our home, stripped Faruku naked and roasted him in full view of everyone in the village. It turned out that after a night of heavy drinking, Faruku had nodded off at the wheel and driven a busload of passengers into the concrete base of an electricity pole. He killed them all and fled the scene before the police arrived. He'd come home to share what time he had left with his family and his God. He must have known he was little more than a dead man praying. The men in the grey Volvo threw four worn tires over his head, sprinkled his hair with petrol and set him alight. All that yellow skin that the women desired fried and sizzled in its own fat. 
Our mother watched, and even when smoke stung her eyes, she just kept telling hysterical onlookers in her told-you-so voice that it was the bus that drove him to his death. Faruku's head eventually stopped its manic nodding, at which point Mama's strength failed her. She collapsed to the warm earth like an old linen cloth. We buried Faruku in the cornfields, but we did not mark the grave. It wasn't a resting place anyone wanted to remember, but it was secretly comforting for Mama to know he was near. I cried until my eyes nearly dropped out of my head. Where were the police? Why was there no investigation, no newspaper articles? Do you know why? I'll tell you. The rich own this world, and the poor are nothing. My view of the world was altered greatly in those weeks. It was the women who surprised me the most. When Faruku was alive, they would not let me rest, but as soon as his body disappeared beneath the soil, they turned their affection to other men, and the younger brothers of those men. It was as if Faruku's yellow skin had never existed. They avoided my eyes when they saw me, even Latudun. Women are such fickle creatures. They will eventually destroy this world with their slippery, slimy snails. I told myself that Faruku's death would not be in vain, and that I would become everything the world had denied him. Despite being known as younger brother of the murderer driver, I wanted to become a driver too. I moved to Ibadan at the age of 19, a time when Latudun and her ilk were sprouting grey hairs and dragging calloused heels around the village. I responded to a roadside advert and was employed by a man who was starting his own business with money he got from I don't know where. What business is that of mine? As long as my salary is put in my hand at the end of every month, nothing else concerns me. As soon as I saw my boss, I knew he thought of himself as a rich man. He talked like one, acted like one. He still does. In turn, I play my part as the driver, the poor driver, the driver whose belly will never know fullness. He has been good to me, but therein lies my problem. I pity him. What do you expect after we have sat buttock to buttock nearly every day for going on 18 years? I swear the only thing worse than a rich man is one who seeks to be a good man. A few months after I started working for him, he told me his wife was having trouble conceiving, but I said nothing. Days afterwards, his wife too started talking to me about her problems. I didn't say anything to her either, but she started giving me gifts and making eyes at me. She told me she didn't know anybody in Ibadan and she needed a friend. I told her to consider opening a shop alongside other women. Isn't that the way women make friends and start their idle gossiping? Anyway, one day, my boss sent me home to collect a parcel he had left in her care. It was a hot afternoon and my mouth was dry. She was home when I arrived and she let me sit indoors. When she returned from her bedroom, she found me in her husband's chair. I was a little frivolous in those days, but what else would you expect from a young man who didn't own an armchair? Instead of chiding me, she asked me to remain in the chair and laughed. Next thing I knew, she was sitting on top of me, riding me like a horse. I cannot say I resisted, but remember, my boss's wife is not a woman of modest proportions. She pinned me down with the strength of three men. I thought maybe I should tell her to stop, but she covered my mouth with her hand. Or maybe I covered my own mouth. It all happened so long ago. I don't remember things clearly now. All I know is that it was like stealing the fattest chicken breast from a rich man's dining table. After that, whenever my boss sent me to his home on errands, I found myself sitting in that armchair, being ridden like a new saddle. I don't know what I liked more, the fan above our heads, my boss's armchair, or the riding I received in it. Within a few months, her belly swelled like a boil. Boils are very painful. Even after they have burst, they itch and itch. I don't know whether the child, Segi, is mine. Only a mother knows who the father of her child is. All I know is that two years later, I found myself in the chair again. I swear, I should have been born a horse. I sometimes imagined that my boss's wife was Latudun. Ah! Even now, when I stop at a beer shack to eat snail, I fork it and nibble gently, as a small tribute. <laughs> don't mock me, please. Iafemi asks me to deliver messages to a man in Budija the rich and their surplus. I didn't even have to ask before Tunde stuffed my hand with money. Iyafemi couldn't have felt worse than me when Tunde left. Ah, it was as if my own brother had died. My boss is not that generous. After he gives me my salary, he removes his eyes until the next month. He doesn't know that I eat freely from his kitchen. I eat his beef, his stripe, his kidney, his liver, his tongue, all the things that my wife's pots dream of, but never cook. My children think it is terrifying when stew is not riddled with small strips of cowhide. Maybe it is better that they do not taste what their mouths will never be accustomed to. Iyasegi's second child was a boy. He does not resemble his father. Sometimes, when I look at him and close my eyes, I think my young son will grow up and look like him. If you think I care about that, it means you have not heard a word I have said. What would I do with Babasegi's son when I can barely feed the ones I have? <laughs> my life is simple and I want to keep it that way. The lot of poor men is to get what they can and go quietly. Judge me if you want to. Call me disloyal. I think I have acted as honorably as a poor man could. If you can't accept that, I leave you to your mischievous thoughts. When I tire of this job, I will leave. There are always adverts for good drivers. Like I said, my life is simple and I want to keep it that way. Farewell. Taju heard the sound of vomiting, but only realized the source of it when Babasegi staggered to the open door of the pickup. 
His breakfast had formed a colorful bib on his gleaming white shirt. Take me to teacher, he ordered. His eyes were bloodshot, as if he'd been weeping blood. A few minutes before, Taju had seen Iyasegi leaving the building. Her feet were all over the place, like an inebriated dancer's. She blew her nose into the headscarf she clutched. Taju's first instinct was to hide, but he resisted and walked towards her. Iyasegi, are you not going back with us? he asked. No, I am going home by myself, Taju. My husband knows. Her shame was complete. The mere sight of Taju made her filthy. Your husband knows what? That his children are not his children. Did you mention my name? Yasegi stopped in her tracks and jerked her head backwards. Have you taken leave of your senses? I have one foot in my husband's house and one foot out of it. And all you can ask is whether I mentioned your name? <laughs> she resumed her usual matriarchal tone. I told my husband about his children. How does that concern you? I'm sorry if I appear thoughtless, but I also have a family to feed. I work in your household, so if there is something that could bring my employment to an end, is it not right that I should be warned? My boss has been good to me. He knew she knew what he was talking about, and he wasn't going to give her the satisfaction of thinking he thought she didn't. Perhaps you do not understand me, Taju. The question of whether or not you will be relieved of your duties is between you and your boss. I was just thinking that, no, Taju, don't think. Face your driving. That is your job, is it not? Yasegi swung her whole body round and stormed off in the direction of the hospital gates. Taju scratched his scalp with his matchstick and headed back to the pickup. He felt exposed, as if the skin of his stomach had been chaffed away by the breeze. His innards were an unpleasant spectacle, and he knew straight away that it was not a sight he could live with. Sir, are you all right? Taju inquired as Babasegi collapsed himself into the passenger seat. Just drive. Taju waited for the wind to fill his collar. There's been something I've been meaning to tell you. He cleared his throat nervously. I have to travel to Ulubo. My mother has been taken ill. My relatives say there is death in her eyes. When are you going? Babasegi didn't look his way. He remembered that he'd given Taju money for his mother's funeral two years before. I can't say I received the message this morning. I take it you want your salary early then. So Taju was leaving. <laughs> Any financial assistance would be greatly appreciated, sir. They say when one god is aggrieved, he invites other gods to join him in seeking vengeance. Babasegi felt as if ten winds were whirling in his head. He felt the force of wrath and wondered what he had done to make the gods smite him. Just take me to teacher. I will pay you when we get there, if you want. Thank you, sir. There was no gratitude in his voice, just disquiet. He mulled over Iyasegi's confession. Only a fool asks who struck a match when he sees billows of smoke on his rooftop. Iyasegi had brought an end to an 18-year companionship. He glanced at his boss, sitting there, stinking of vomit, but he did not feel any guilt. There was fear, but no guilt. Babasagi was twice his height and thrice his weight. He had seen him handle Bolanli. They didn't call him a leopard because he had spots. In silence, they drove. Babasagi ignored the flies that were drawn to the stench of his garments. Ordinarily, he would have slapped them off, but today he sat still and let them feed on him. Babasagi was practicing being dead. He took intermittent deep breaths and wondered if life could drain from him if he drew one deep enough. When Babasagi put the money in Taju's hand, he clutched his driver's small fingers and looked deep into his face. Taju flinched and pulled away, but Babasagi didn't relinquish his fingertips. Will you not give me my keys before you go? He was completely unaware that Taju's bladder was brimming. He took the keys and gave Taju his hand back. Go well, he urged. Thank you, sir. Taju did not look back, but marched across the road with long, swift strides. Babasagi returned to teacher's shack, wishing that his thick legs would buckle under him. He saw the ugliness of his surroundings, the bowed buildings, the shattered planks held together by moisture rising from festering gutters the uneven roads that sighed dust clouds every time a car upset their calm. There was a woman outside teacher's shack. Her thighs were bandaged in a micro-mini denim skirt and her breasts bound in a fuchsia boob tube that matched her lipstick. Any other day, Babasegi would have made a snide comment about the rigidity with which she paced. Can you breathe all right? He might have asked, feigning concern. Or he might have said, if I didn't have a home full of wives and children, I would make you my bride. It would have been said with a trivial superior air, of course. To this, the woman would have replied, is it the way I walk you are interested in or the way I fuck? Or she might have responded to his condescension with a loud hiss that would pursue him all the way to his destination. Aikara women were desperate, but they spat in the face of insolence. Today, Babasegi's eyes were dim with melancholy. His wit would not be roused. He sniffed past the woman and bowed into teacher's shack. The small space was full of men eager to drink the afternoon away. Many of them were already well on their way. Two night guards defied sleep. They leaned their staffs on the wooden walls and dipped their fingers into their glasses to remove dead insects. A few of the men, who had made guzzling whiskey their purpose for the day, as it had been the day before and the day before that, huddled together on low stools, playing drafts and laughing at unrelated anecdotes. 
Babasagi was irritated by their disregard for life's many tragedies. Angry beads of sweat collected at his brow, careered through the furrows, and formed tears at the tip of his nose. Teacher rose and beckoned to him. My life is ruined. Babasagi wiped his forehead with his palm. I feel as if I am in a pit of quicksand. All is dark, teacher. All is dark. Where there is hope, there is life. Teacher absorbed his tale with compassion and contentment. A sense of comradeship brewed within him. It was comforting to hear that another man had been stripped of his manhood. If he could live in the knowledge that his penis would never prize apart a woman's lips, why couldn't Babasegi live with his predicament? At least he could soften a woman with his hardness. Where is the hope? There is a rainbow at the mouth of every tunnel. I don't understand. Hmm. Teacher got up and refilled the glass that Babasegi had emptied. What I will say to you will seem like the words of a madman, but you must consider them. He cast his shimmering eyes on Babasegi's face and murmured, It is time for you to let the deceivers who have brought bastards into your home return to their father's houses. Babasegi clasped his hands together and bunched them under his chin. His head became heavy quite suddenly. Just send them away like one shoes chickens? It is the only honorable thing to do, teacher continued, his eyes widening at the thought of Babasegi frequenting his shack and spending his money there. As you spread your mat in this life, so you must lie on it. He paused. Unless, he pointed until his fingertip was within an inch of Babasegi's nose. You want a home full of children that are yours in name alone. A curse, that would be a curse. The thought disturbed Babasegi greatly. Teacher raised his hands in triumph. Listen to me. When the missionaries left me behind, the thing that made me bitterest was that I had taken them to be my fathers. They plucked me from my father's home when I was a young boy and made me feel like I was their own. But when the time came for them to return to their country, they abandoned me here, as a cockerel casts aside the shells of groundnuts. He sipped his whiskey and looked dismally at the clouds of smoke that blew upwards from half-parted lips and partly extinguished cigarette butts. For three years I despaired, unable to accept my lot. Orphans are miserable people, you know. The rooftop of the next building caught his eye. It was not until I returned to my blood father that my misery was washed away. What I am trying to say is that your father will always be your father, even when life forces you to find a father in strangers. Are you saying that my children will one day seek their true fathers? That all I have been is a temporary caretaker? Babasagi spat the last few words out, as if they'd burnt his tongue. Indeed, my friend, you have been no more than a doorkeeper. The day those children can open doors by themselves, they will depart and you will be left with nothing but your loss. Babasegi nodded. Teacher, your wisdom humbles me. Don't say that, Baba, uh, my friend. Pride makes men tumble before they fall. Mission accomplished. Teacher took a satisfying slug of his brew and scratched his chin. Silence. With each passing hour, the silence in the Alao house grew until it was so sharp it stung the eye and drew salt water from the nose. The wives sat in their armchairs, waiting for Babasegi to return and determine their fates. Each one thought of words with which to blame the others, but their throats were parched with worry. Every so often, their minds would stray to their children, tucked away in their beds, oblivious to the uncertainty of their futures, unaware of the possibility that tonight might be the last time they slept in their own beds. Bolanle sat on the floor, with Segi's head resting on her shoulder. She had seen Iasegi return home with red eyes and a snot-stained headscarf, but she couldn't make sense of the grief on the other wives' faces. There was regret and remorse. But why? Segi too had absorbed this air of dread. She had become perplexed and her temperature had risen briefly. Bolanle had swathed her all over with a damp cloth and she seemed more rested now. Still, she refused to go to bed. Every time a car revved up their street, she would lift her head and ask, Is my father back? To which the older wives looked at one another, unable to respond. Finally, just before the clock struck eleven, the pickup rolled into the compound. The engine stopped abruptly and the door slammed. Segi straightened her neck. He has arrived, her mother said, plugging her daughter's mouth. The stones fled Babasegi's unsteady footsteps. He battled with the sliding door and stumbled into the building, carrying the stench of vomit and stale whiskey. Bolali rose to greet him, but Babasegi didn't see her or Segi. So the witches have gathered for blood, he slurred, glaring at the other wives who were seated with their heads bowed. Go back to the evil spirits who sent you and tell them I wasn't home when you stopped by. He tore off his soiled shirt and dashed it to the floor. Segi has been waiting for you, Bolanle entreated, hoping that talk of his sick daughter might sober him a little. Has she? Tell me why she waits for me. You wives, tell me why, he yelled, pointing his lips in the direction of his wives. Baba Segi, let us not do it this way. Yasegi thought she might bring reason, the way she'd always done. 
Babasegi was not having her reason tonight. He lunged at her and raised his arm until it almost touched the ceiling fan. Then with one smooth sweep, he brought it down onto her jaw. Everyone jumped, including Segi who was groaning. Her father hadn't acknowledged her and she thought she might impress him by lifting her head off the floor. May the dogs eat your mouth! Babasegi towered over Iyasegi. What mouth do you have to tell me how to do anything? You, who have brought bastard children into my home. You have used me, wounded me. His voice lowered to a growl. But let me tell you, the lion has roared, the dog has barked, the mouse has squeaked. Enough is enough. Yasegi's face rested on the arm of her seat, where the force of the slap had sent it. The other wives were silent, half waiting for Babasegi to turn on them as well. Then, Iyafemi had a brainwave and decided to sing her signature tune. It was the devil, she proclaimed, kneeling in supplication on the cold terrazzo floor. Yes, <laughs> it was the devil, and I am tired of doing his job for him. He must come and take his offspring from my house. Babasegi straightened, as if he dared the devil to disobey him. Babasegi, what has brought all this on? Bolande's voice made him swing round. Surprisingly, his face softened. What has caused this? I will tell you. In fact, I should thank you first, because had it not been for you, I would never have discovered the deceit I have been living with for all these years. He winced. It was revealed in hospital today that none of my children are my children. I found out, just today, that the children I have nurtured and called mine were sired by men my wives lay on their backs for. As he said this, he coughed up phlegm and aimed what he had collected at Iyafemi. He aimed well. It flew through the air and landed on her forehead with a splatter. She dared not raise her sleeve to wipe it. Babasegi paced the room and returned to his chair, knocking the headscarf off Iyatope's head on the way. Her reflexes served her. Like a child who had spotted a snake on her bed, she leapt off her chair and pressed herself into the corner of the room. Halot, he said accusingly. He eyed her with disgust. Then with one nod, he was dead to the world. Bolanle's eyes were still travelling from wife to wife when a thudding intruded on her curiosity. The back of Segi's bald head was rhythmically slapping the bare terrazzo floor. Her eyes had rolled upwards, revealing ripe yellow eyeballs. Her tongue hung out of the side of her mouth, clasped into place by clenched teeth. Yasegi woke from her slap-induced slumber and raced to her daughter's side. She wrapped her arms around Segi's belly and hoisted her into a sitting position. Segi! Segi! Yatope yelled. It was a beseeching ball to a child dancing on the rim of a yawning well. Bolanli ran to the kitchen to fetch a bowl of water and returned with trembling hands. Iyatope dipped her hands into the bowl and sprinkled droplets on Segi's face, while Iyafemi rubbed the young girl's left hand, hoping to restore warmth to it. The jittering eased into a rigidity that made Segi's toes lengthen and spread like a rake's fingers. Her arms straightened at the elbows and her neck extended out of her shoulders. Her face held the look of pain so glorious that it brought tears to the eyes of all four women. Then, after a long, deep breath, Segi exhaled all the life within her. All the tension and agony were suddenly gone from her face, leaving her slightly open eyes staring at the stool beyond her bloodless toenails. Iyasegi immediately withdrew her arm from behind her daughter's neck. She rose slowly to her feet and stepped backwards, her eyes never leaving her daughter's lifeless body. Even when her back touched the wall, she was not convinced she couldn't take another step back. I have seen what a mother's eyes must never see, she gasped, as if someone had asked. She took a determined bow, but before Iyatope could restrain her, she slammed the back of her head into the wall. She didn't blink, nor did she flinch. She would have gone for a second slam had Iyatope's arms not held her in a headlock. Iyafemi joined in, and before long, the three of them were rolling around on the floor in a tangled ball of arms and feet. Bolanle, who had been staring at Segi's face, untied the wrapper from her bosom and laid it gently over Segi's body. Cover her face, Iyatope yelled. A mother must not see her child's eyes after life has left them. Bolanle lifted the cloth at the hem and pulled it over Segi's face, thus unveiling delicate yellow feet. She marveled at the handsomeness of each toe and turned to the sound of Baba Segi's strident snoring. Every so often, a grunt escaped Baba Segi's mouth, but the women of the Alao household could not sleep. When fatigue threatened to take them, grief prodded them awake and tears rolled down their faces in an unending stream. Also, since none of them had the courage to move Segi's body, their children woke to find her stiffened beneath a tie-dye wrapper in the center of the sitting room. The older children huddled in twos and watched the younger ones defeat the urge to ask why their sister had a cloth over her head. Akin sat by his sister's feet and sobbed. At about 6 a.m., Babasegi blinked and was confronted by ten pairs of probing, bloodshot eyes. He shut his eyes as if to do a private appraisal of the situation, but when he opened them again, his gaze moved from the veiled mound on the floor to Iyasegi's face. Without speaking, 
he hauled himself out of his chair and headed for his bedroom, followed by a stream of warm urine. He must have believed no one could hear him because he let out consecutive howls so haunting that the neighbors hurried to their gates. By the time Aki had found the keys and let them in, Babasegi had returned to his seat, fully dressed, except his trousers were inside out. No one cared to mention it. Careful to avoid the mound in the center of the room, he fixed his eyes on one of the visibly concerned neighbors and asked where he could buy a coffin. His words were punctuated by hiccups. They sell them by the roadside, between Sabu and Ulita Mary. But please, Babasegi, my husband will go and buy it. As if the directions were all she'd uttered, Babasegi walked out, leaving his family gaping at the hem of his trousers. A doctor was called to certify Segi dead, and Iyasegi was led away to a neighbor's house. With fear and great sadness, the other wives prepared to change Segi's clothes. Halfway through the process, Iyafemi fled to the guest toilet and threatened to kill herself if anyone tried to persuade her to come out. Aki helped to lift his sister's weightless body into the soft cushioning of the small coffin. The neighbor drove carefully, but the potholes made the coffin tip and slide against the metal. Aki held the varnished gray box through the entire journey to the cemetery. Everything was arranged by the time they got there, a favor from another kind neighbor. Aki, Bolanle, Iyatope and the neighbor lugged the coffin past the cemetery gates and forced it into a shallow grave between two headstones. The inscription on the one on the right had been ground away by the elements. Knowing his sister would be buried in an unmarked grave, Aki cast the words on the small marble slab on the left to memory. Dola, Oladeji, much loved and greatly missed. It wasn't much of a burial. It was taboo for parents to attend their children's funerals so there was no mother to wail for her. Understandably also, there were no priests, no prayers, no graveside blessing to set her on her way. There was only a smirking gravedigger leaning against a tree, hoping to receive a sizable tip for a space well found and a grave hastily dug. Aki and Bolanli bowed away from Segi's grave, arm in arm, knock-kneed and dumb with grief. When they returned to their street, the words, may she be forgiven, echoed from every window and every door. Segi had defied the course of nature and spat out the milk from her mother's breast. It was a sin, but a forgivable one. A verdict, nevertheless, left to the gods. Together they entered Babasegi's bedroom, Bolanle one step behind Aki and the Atope. Is it done? he asked. It is, Bolanle replied, turning to leave. She didn't want to be there. She wanted to mourn in private. Aki blinked back tears. My father, I want to be a man about this, but I fear I am weak. Babasegi looked at the tall, gangly boy sitting hunched on the edge of his bed. The word father made every other word echo, but it was distinct and comforting to his ears. Aki, you are more than a man, for it is only a true man who acknowledges his weakness. Your sister will watch over you from the next world. Know this and let it strengthen you. Was there something I could have done, Baba? Was there some way I could have saved her? Baba Segi hummed uncomfortably and shook his head. He felt tears heating the backs of his eyes. Hmm, you are not a god, so strike that from your mind. We are mere mortals who must humbly accept our destinies. Papa, I am tired, but I am afraid to sleep. I don't want to wake up and remember she is no longer with me. Where will I find the strength to live on? You will find the strength. We must all find the strength. That is the way it is for men. We wake up to find the things are not the way we imagined them. But what can we do? Baba Segi's thoughts claimed him. He covered his mouth with his palm and looked up at the ceiling. My father, let me go and ensure that my brothers and sisters are comforted. I have been away from the house for a few hours now. Before you go, child, I have some words for you, Babasegi started abruptly. His eyes are naturally eager. Keep these words in your left hand, lest you wash them away after eating with your right. When the time comes for you to marry, take one wife and one wife alone. And when she causes you pain, as all women do, remember it is better that your pain comes from one source alone. Listen to your wife's words. Listen to the words she doesn't speak so that you will be prepared. A man must always be prepared. I hear you, Baba. Aki was baffled by his father's candidness, but he suspected it was grief talking. He was only 13 and marriage was far from his mind. He saw that Baba Segi's eyes had closed, so he rose from the mattress and tiptoed towards the door. As he placed his hand on the door handle, Baba Segi called his name and motioned for him to return to the space he advocated. The older man reached out to place his hand on top of Aki's head. He pressed his fingers into Aki's hair and stroked his face. Go to your younger ones. He withdrew his hand and placed it flat on his chest. Staying power. No one expected Babasegi to call a family meeting so early into the morning period, but he was pursued by his own tragedy. 
One part of him wanted to weep, the other wanted to scratch the tip of his contempt to release the hardening pus within. In the three weeks his family had tiptoed around the house, muffling all the symptoms of healing, his discomfort had throbbed like a boil. When he couldn't take it any longer, he waited until the children had retired to their beds and instructed Iatope to summon the other wives. Babasegi sat in his chair, waiting, contemplating the manliest, most honorable way to present his proposal. Iyasegi arrived first, draped in black. She had tasted her first meal just hours before, and already the pleasure of nourishment filled her with guilt. She had lost a considerable amount of weight, and the folds of skin she dragged around slowed her pace. No one attempted to comfort her because she rejected it outright, preferring the solitude of her room or the silent reflection she engaged in when in company. Iyatope followed, her face creased with tiredness. As the second wife, the well-being of the children had now become her responsibility. A few steps behind her, Iyafemi, her head wrapped in a scarf, joined them. Segi's death had induced an epiphany. She had lost weight too, but hers was from fervent fasting. On the day of the burial, she burnt all her flamboyant items of clothing. True to her character, she hid grandma's gold under her bed and pretended she didn't remember it was there when she prayed. Bolani came in quietly and perched on a stool, her fingers linked to calm her nerves. For the first four nights after Segi had passed away, she jumped at the slightest rattle. Segi's breath remained in her bedroom and disturbed her. Every day for the last two weeks, she'd washed the walls down with Dettol, but in spite of the antiseptic, the stench would not go away. Babasegi's head was propped up by his fist. I have called you today because I am full of words. Words that threaten to tear my belly apart if they remain unsaid. This is a time of mourning, but a man must be mindful when weakness threatens to take him over. He looked at each wife and they stared back, wondering if their flesh could endure any more misery. I will not pretend the words that struck my ears at the hospital have not preyed on my mind, the way hunger preys on the mind of a motherless child. I have been deeply wounded. It is not every day that a man discovers his life is a mere shadow and that there is a gulf between what he believes and reality. Neither is it every day that a man finds that his children are not his own. He raised his eyebrows in resignation and paused as if to regain his composure. The words teacher had forced into his belly were now stuck in his throat like large orange pips. They refused to be swallowed but were reluctant to be spat out. He took a deep breath. I want you to know that you can go. The door is open. I will not stop you. But where? Where? Go where? Iafemi was terrified. Wherever you please. I do not want to keep you here. But where will we go? Perhaps the father of your children will take you. Babasegi mumbled, shrugging his enormous shoulders. My lord. Iasegi cleared her throat. I have considered your words, and they are wise. More than wise, they are justified. Babasegi nodded, half in appreciation that his words were understood, and half in the knowledge that he knew Iyasegi could be trusted to conjure a faultless response to his proposition. You talk of the father of our children. Who is the father of our children? Who is the father of the child who now rots below the ground? Her voice broke, but she continued. There is no other but you. You named her. You named every child in this house, every one. You have nurtured them, so it is your name they will bear. You may say that there are other fathers, but you are the only father they know. You alone have been their father, for it takes more than shedding seed to be a father. The other wives puffed their chests out in agreement, all except Bolande, who was deep in thought. Iyasegi continued, her voice cool like balm. I have sat for many days now, faint with grief, but my sins have been at the very top of my chest, beating over all else. I take the sins of these women onto myself, heap them on me and let me bear them for the rest of my days. If you want to punish us for our misdeeds, let me single-handedly carry the waste bucket. Send me into the marketplace with it and then let the world smell my misfortunes. I say this because it was I who led these women into the darkness that engulfs them now. It was my eagerness to bear children that destroyed them. Babasegi nodded in concurrence, but he was silent. Arms that were earlier folded over his chest dropped to his sides. Yasegi knew him better than the others who sat there silenced by anguish, so she dealt her final card. My lord, I know you want to send me off into the wilderness but I beseech you to have mercy on me. My eyes have already seen what no mother's eyes should see. Forgive me, for I seek nothing else but to stay by your side, serving you as I have done all these years. Consider that I have lost one child, but there is yet one remaining. I give that child to you. Take him. Own him. What do I know about bringing up his son? Which words will I use to chastise him? If your heart does not forgive me, my lord, take Aki. And if your heart accepts me to serve you, Receive me also. With this, she lowered herself onto her knees, lay flat on the floor, and reached out her hands until they held her husband's feet. My lord, she whispered, let us not allow the world to see our shame. Let us keep our secrets from those who may seek to mock us. 
She was good, Bolanli thought, as she watched the other wives join her in her supplication. Only then did it all fall into place. Babaseki's big testicles were empty and without seed. Bolanli. The decision was easy and was met, as I expected, with understanding. I knew Babasegi didn't want me to leave, but the recent revelations had left him without a viable alternative. It was more important to him, as Yasegi had understood, that his manhood be protected. An agreement was drawn up. They could stay if they promised to be the wives he wanted them to be. He promptly banned them from leaving the house without his permission. Yasegi was instructed to close down all her shops and relinquish every kobo she had saved to him. Iyafemi was forbidden to wear makeup, and there would be no more church. God hears your heart, no matter where you are, he'd said. Surprisingly, he didn't have any rules for Iyatope. Rather, he came to favor her and now decided to spend most of his nights with her. In return, Babasegi swore to buy them all the jewelry, all the lace, every luxury they needed and wanted, provided these were only worn within the four walls of his home. On the day he called a meeting to lay down these new laws, everyone was given the opportunity to respond. Iyasegi sobbed silently and said she was just grateful for Babasegi's graciousness. Iyatope smiled. His words greatly satisfied her. Iyafemi launched into prayer and asked that God bless Babasegi with the riches of Solomon. When it was my turn, I simply said I'd thought about it and decided to return to my parents' house. Babasegi was taken aback. He asked if he had offended me in any way. I told him he had not and explained that there was no point staying if I wouldn't be able to give him children. He listened attentively and promised that he would always be there to give me anything I ever needed. I saw the sadness in his eyes. It was as if it had just dawned on him that our paths had crossed for a purpose, but we were never meant to be together. Of course, I couldn't tell him that I felt as if I'd woken up from a dream of unspeakable self-flagellation. It started a few days after Seki died. I'd walk through the house and feel as if I was in the midst of strangers, people from a different time in history, a different world. I didn't feel soiled anymore. The other thing was that a young girl had died for sins that were not hers. Seki came to my mind too frequently. I couldn't get the picture of her dying next to me out of my head. Perhaps she would still be alive if I'd never come to Babasegi's home. Then again, Babasegi would never have known about his wives and their deceit. I will remember Babasegi. I won't miss him, but I will remember him. Perhaps on some days, I will remember him with fondness. I have learned many things from the years I spent under his roof. It was being in his house that shook me awake. I will be thankful for that. The wives will be relieved by my departure, I know. Maybe not Iyatope but the other two will remember me as the wicked wind that upturned the tranquility of their home. When they talk about me, they will console one another by calling me the uppity outsider, the one who couldn't cut it as an Alao wife. I will remember them as inmates, because what really separates us is that I have rejoined my life's path. They are going nowhere. One after the other, they offered to help me gather my belongings, but I told them I could manage. There wasn't much left to pack anyway. Much of it was never unpacked. Aki offered to, even if I'd said no, he wouldn't have listened. He helped me load up the waiting taxi. He stood alone by the gate and waved until I was out of sight. Don't think I can't see the challenges ahead of me. People will say I am a second-hand woman. Men will hurt and ridicule me, but I won't let them hold me back. I will remain in the land of the living. I am back now, and the world is spread before me like an egg cracked open. We hope you have enjoyed